Hi, so today we're going to be looking at junior cycle fiction. So before we're going to be focused on the novel. So before we start, we're just going to go through what the junior cycle fiction part of the exam is. So in your junior cycle final examination, so the one you'll be sitting in June, you might be asked to answer questions on unseen fiction and studied fiction. So our unseen fiction is like an extract that will come up on the paper that we've never seen before. And you have to answer questions on it. And our studied one is a question will be asked on something we've studied during our junior cycle. So in order to do well in this area of the course, you will need to read a variety of short stories and novels. You need to have studied two novels, so two novels, and a selection of short stories in depth. So you need to know these novels and a short story off the back of your hand. You will need to use appropriate critical vocabulary when you're responding to these texts as well. This is a moon. Um, so in the section studied fiction, you will have an opportunity to write with knowledge and enthusiasm on the text that you've studied in second and third year. So these novels could be possibly like Bog Child, um, The Lord of the Flies, um, Once of Mice and Men, novels like that. It's unlikely that you'll be asked to write all of your study texts in these final examinations. So you could be asked a question on maybe a Shakespearean play and a film, but then you won't be asked on a poem, a short story or a novel. So it depends what comes up with the paper. So just moving on to this box I have of terms and definitions. So these are the sort of, this is the sort of language we need to be kind of using when we're talking about fiction. So alliteration. So this one comes up in poetry as well. So the repetition of initial constant sounds in a series of words in a sentence. Antagonist, a character against which the protagonist struggles. So this is the anti-hero, this is the villain of the story. Characterization, how a character is presented, revealed and developed. The climax, so the point of the highest drama or the turning point in a text, so like where it like meets the very very top if you've ever seen that graph which we'll have which I have in this further as we get through this further uh, so conflict is struggle between opposing forces of a text dialogue conversations of characters in the text so when characters are communicating with each other figuratively language that provides a second meaning to the literal one foil so a foil is a character used to contrast with the protagonist so the protagonist is the main character. Foreshadowing. So hints of what is to come in the text. Genre. The style or type of story. Irony. The complete opposite of what is expected to come in the text. Language techniques. These are just very similar to our poetic techniques. So these are just, if when it says here, be able to use and identify the language techniques. What we're talking about here is poetic techniques or alliteration, metaphors, similes, all that. Then we have metaphor coming up right now. So a comparison between two things, for example, life is a roller coaster. So we're comparing life to being like a roller coaster here. So these are the two things they're being compared against. Plot, the main sequence of events in a text and a plot twist, an unexpected outcome or event in the story. So something we didn't expect coming from the start. Protagonist, that's our main character. That's maybe our hero as well. Resolution, the unraveling of a plot at the end of the text or a text. Setting, where and when the story takes place. Sibilance, specific form of alliteration that uses soft, constant sounds to create a hissing effect. So this one, which I can never say. She sells, she, she sells sea, seashells on the sea shore. I find that one so difficult to do. Say that three times fast. Subplot, a secondary storyline. So this might be a storyline that's going on kind of behind our main plot or our main storyline. Symbolism, symbols or objects that represent something more than itself. So they're in. if you've done once ever, um, there's a symbol of the carrot, which is like a symbol of hope for the main character in that text. Theme, a strong idea or a message that reoccurs. And narrative styles. Then we've got our first person or a third person. So first person is I, and then third person is there's no I felt this way. It's coming from like a god point, a godlike view. So you need to understand each of the following key areas for fiction. 
So we've got first, we've got characters, we've got plot, we've got setting, and we've got theme. So there are four key elements when it comes to fiction. So we're going to start with characters. So my head again. So characters play an important role in texts. They have been created by the author in order to engage the reader. Your task is to explain how they've been created. Pay close attention to the author's description of characters by acknowledging direct information versus implied information. So we're going to get into what direct versus implied information is now. Okay, so writers use different methods when they're creating these fictional characters. So we've got direct information first. The reader will be given direct information from the author about the character. So this is where we're told from the author stuff about this character. Where implied information is information can be given through a character's actions. The writer does not tell us directly, but allows us to form an opinion on the character based on how they act or react in situations. So we have an exam, and most authors will use a combination of both of these in their writing. So we'll kind of be told stuff about characters, but then we'll also be like, stuff will be implied about the characters as well. So I have an example here from Harry Potter, if anyone has familiar with Harry Potter or has read the books. So he was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences spying on neighbours. Okay, so I might give a second to that while I figure out where my pen is um, to see where we might find implied information versus direct information. Okay, let me find the pen. Okay, so with this example here, so he was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. So very large moustache, hardly any neck, and big, beefy man. Is there any actions here that we could, that this could mean that it's implied or is this direct? It's, I would say it's direct information because all we're really getting is a physical description of this person. So we know he's big, he's a beefy man, and he's got very little neck and he's a big moustache on his face. Now, if we move on to Mrs. Dursey. Well, so Mrs. Dursey was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent most, so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on neighbours. So with this, Mrs. Dursey was thin and blonde. It's going to be the same. That's direct information. And had nearly twice the amount of neck. Still direct information. But this bit here, which came in very useful. I'm just going to change the colour of my pen. Because she spent so much of her time craning over the garden fences, spying on neighbours. So what might this tell us about? So these are the actions of Miss Dursley. So what might this tell us about Miss Dursley? Well, first of all, she's got a very... A very large neck, very long neck that she uses to spy on neighbors. So maybe that might tell us that maybe she's like a nosy neighbor, that she's always like poking her head in other people's businesses. Maybe she's always distracted by what's going out on the road. And we don't get that same information or we don't see the same actions from Mr. Dursley up here, who's just the big beefy man. Okay, so that's just an example of implied versus direct information from an author which is very useful when we're talking about characters and now we're looking at dialogue so what characters say and the way they say it can reveal their attitudes and certain aspects of their personality so in diet when we look at dialogue and text we kind of get a deeper insight into these characters than just what the author is telling us we can also learn about characters from what others say about them and from how they relate to other characters. So maybe when other characters are talking about certain characters in a text, we find out more about those characters from the perspective of other people. So if we're thinking about characters, we think like, are these characters liked by others? And can we explain how we know they're liked by the other characters? And if they are, why are they? And if they're not, why not? What's What are the character flaws in this person? 
What characters can say about themselves and their feelings can give us insight into their personalities and attitudes and motives as well. So when characters talk about themselves, there's loads of hints on how we can kind of gather information from characters so we can write about them. So what they say to others and how they say it, what others say about them, if they're liked, if they get along with people or characters, sorry, or what they say about themselves. So how do they view themselves or talk themselves or appear to view themselves versus how they talk to other people, other characters. Right, so questions on characters. So when you're discussing the character, highlight or underline anything in which you could use to support your points. This is when we have our unseen one. So if we're asked maybe on a character, on an unseen extract, that we would underline maybe parts of the extract where we're really seeing some characteristic traits or maybe what they look like, what the author's told us about them, what they've said about themselves what others characters might have said about them or even what their actions are telling us. Jot down a few words to describe the character. So that'll be in our little plan that we do. Jot down maybe a few little lines. And remember that we're looking for qualities or traits of the character and keep that your central focus. So we're not looking at what happened in the story. We're just looking at the sp specific character and don't summarize. Just remember, please don't summarize. Try to keep the focus on the character. So we're just going to move on to plot now. So what is the plot of the story? So the plot refers to the sequence of events or the shape of the story or the shape that the story takes. So that can look different in every story. So when we're analyzing the plot, these are some questions that we need to consider. So how is the time sequence handled? Is it chronological order? Is everything happening one by one going kind of in a straight line? Is there, is this, this happened here, but then we're looking back here and there's flashbacks. There's one flashback, there's a series of flashbacks that shape the narrative. How and when are new characters introduced? Are we introduced to every single character or do we meet people along the way on our journey? What complications, what obstacles arise for the main character? So what's happening in the story? Is, is how, what's our main character faced with? Is everything just going fine and we're just going in a straight line or is there some sort of rising action, falling action? How is the conflict and tension created? So how does the author create this tension and create the conflict? What is the climax of the story or the turning point? So when do we reach the peak in the story? Is it in the middle? Is it near the end? How does the pace vary? So is everything, like if we're watching a movie, maybe even an action movie, sometimes they start off really, like the action happens right away and then it goes back to something else and then it happens again. There's a lead up and then there's a resolution. And how does the conflict resolve so what happens at the end what's our resolution what happens at the end is the same as we start off are we on the same level is there a difference are we worse off are we better off or are we the same so taking that in consideration here's a graph we've all probably seen by now and how we would kind of map a plot i think it's really useful that we kind of make even mini plot lines for the text that we've studied so we can kind of just remember even the slightest bits in our stories so there's a beginning, middle and end. So this is a very straightforward plot line. A lot of stories won't look like this. So we've got the exposition. This is where we start off. So this is where we first meet whoever we are, our first character. And then maybe we reach our first little bit of conflict here. And that's where we start to go. And this conflict starts and there's a rising action. We're going all the way up to the top. And we're like, stuff is happening. We're going to reach this final turning point in the text or in the story or in the plot where everything's kind of, this is where we're figuring out like what's going to happen. And then there'd be a falling action. So then after the climax, things are kind of coming back down. And then we're at resolution. Now, in a lot of texts, I tried to draw it with this one. I don't know if you can tell. The exposition and the resolution are slightly different. So we didn't just go back to the same place because so much has happened that our lives have changed. The characters' lives have changed in this. So that'd be really useful just even to map out your own plot line for any novel that you've studied. Okay, and now we'll move on to the setting. So the setting of a piece of literature is the world of the narrative, a time and place. This provides a backdrop to the story. So this tells us what's happening in the story. So maybe a story could be set in a historical period. It could be set in the 1950s, in the 1960s. It could be set in World War I. It could be set in, it could be set in the future. It might even happen 
yeah, it could be set in a dystopian future, something that we're not used to now, be set in a certain social environment. So all these things can kind of give us a background to the story on maybe why these characters act that way. So a sentence can be realistic, imaginary, or both. So if they are both, maybe it's set in a time period, like maybe the Second World War, but like everything's made up that's happened. It could be based a little bit in fact, but it's, it's, a, it's made up. It's not realistic. Okay, so then why is the function of a setting important? So it can have a huge effect on the plot and characters. It can establish a mood and atmosphere. So if there's a setting that's quite, like if we're set, if we're set in a story maybe in like a horrible time period when certain characters are not able to live freely, maybe that will show us the mood and how their their lives are affected so deeply because they can't be themselves in this in this part of, in this time period. And that's going to really affect them as a character. It can add to the realism to a narrative. So it can make it feel a bit more realistic. It can be symbolic in nature and related to central themes. So the setting could always be sent, could be come back to a main theme, which we'll look at themes in a, in a few minutes. It can help engage imaginatively with characters and plot. So then questions to ask yourself about setting. So where is the story taking place? When you're considering answering questions on your novel, you need to consider like, where is the story being held? Like, what's the time period for this story? Like, what's happening around this time? Do I know? Why are these characters acting this way? If this book was set in the time, so 2023 now, would these characters be the same? What's the importance of the set in the story? Like, is the setting important? Is there a reason why the author chose to set this novel in 1925 instead of 1973? Is there a reason? And how does the author use language to create a setting? So if we're, for example, if we're talking about if we're talking about maybe a novel that's set in 1920, will we be using the same language now that we'd use in 1920? No. So the author is going to have a sentence, a certain amount of realistic language used to kind of create this setting. And then we've got theme. Okay, so the theme. So the theme is a central idea that provides inspiration for a plot. For example, a short story normally develops on one theme, so one central theme, where a novel could have many. It could have so many themes in a novel. Themes may focus on things such as prejudice, war, love, loyalty, ambition. There's far more, so there's an etc. there. So when we're thinking about questions on theme, you should be able to answer these sort of questions here. So how does theme emerge from the actions and the dialogue of characters? So how can we tell the theme from how the characters are like speaking to each other? How do these major events bring out the theme? So if it's the theme of escapism, how is how is the events lead? Like how are the events that are happening in the story? How are they bringing how are they bringing in that theme of escapism? Why do they want to escape? Why have they escaped? Um, how does the setting contribute to the theme? And how does language and imagery contribute to the theme? So like the author's use of language and then how they're painting the picture of the text for us. How does that contribute to the overall theme of the play? So now we're just going to start looking at sample questions. And we're going to do look at a few brainstorms I've made and then a sample answer. So this one here. So from a novel you study, choose a character who experiences change. So we know this is a character question already. So we've got car oh, my pen's gone. We've got a character question been asked. So from a novel that you've studied, choose a character experience has changed. So keyword there, change. So right, change right here. Change. So first part of it is we've to describe this character at the beginning of the novel. So how were they at the start? So I'll write that here. How were they? If you type function one second. How were they at the start? Happy, sad.
And then we get to the second part here. How was oh, sorry, second part of the first bit, then we so how were they at the start? Happy sad. Um what what uh, life life? So like what were they dealing with at the start of the book? Well like how were they who were they? And then we move on to part B now, sorry. So how has the character changed? So now we're really bringing in the change. So how has the character changed? How has the character changed? Changed. And maybe we want, want to consider why is the character changed? Why change, sorry. So not only just like how has this character changed, but why has this character changed? Is there a reason this character has changed or do they just decide to change for the sake of it? And then this is really important here. So make sure that we're supporting your answer with reference to the text. So whether you do that in a PQE way, which is our point, quote, and explain, or in the PI way, which is point, illustrate, explain, or the tree ups, which is start up, sum up, start up, back up, sum up. So our ways to kind of just intertwine and intertwine our, intertwine our quotes into our answers. Okay, so we're going to have a look at how we planned this. Now, the text, the text I used for this question is, um, second, is of mice and men. So planning our answer. Now, planning can be painful sometimes, but the, I have a few ways. This is one of the ways I do. I just kind of just throw everything on a page. It looks chaotic. It looks messy. But this is the way my brain allows me to focus on things. So of mice and men. So if we're looking at that question again. So describe this character at the beginning of the novel and then how this character changed. The first one I have here, this brainstorm, is just the beginning. This is part A. So of mice and men. So the character I've picked from mice and men is George. He's, I have here, he's a protagonist. He's the hero. Traits, I've got some quotes about traits here. So small, quick, dark face, restless eyes, and sharp, strong features. That's his physical appearance. That was the direct information that the author told me. Um, assumes authority. This is don't drink. So this is what I'm getting from his dialogue on how he's speaking to other characters. So I have over here Lenny. So that's the character I'm kind of using as like a contrast, not contrast, but like a, to talk about. Well, also as a contrast, but to talk about George. Um, mentally more alert. So I've compared George and Lenny here because George is mentally more alert than Lenny. Um, takes responsibility. And then I have here an arrow, but it's getting tired. So he takes responsibility, but he is getting tired. So I might have to add that in because maybe he's changed. Maybe he's got tired by the end of the novel. Um, then I have another trait that he has. He has a dreamlike ability. They can kind of put spells on people when he tells stories. I mentioned this is a story of the farm when he told a story about the farm to Lenny. Um, so he gives comfort and security to other characters, namely Lenny. And realistic, he's a realistic character because he expects trouble. So we can see already from the start that he expects trouble. Okay, so maybe I'll actually just will read through the part A of the sample answer first and then we will um, go back to part B and plan it behind it. So the novel I've studied is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. At the beginning of the novel, we meet the protagonist, George. He is described as being small and quite and small and quick, dark of face with restless eyes and sharp, strong features. We realise that George is mentally more alert, the more alert of the two characters, as his friend Lenny is almost child- is almost like a child in innocence and simplicity. George assumes authority as he orders Lenny, for God's sake, don't drink so much. This is how we learn that George is in charge and for the duration of the story, this remains the case. We also find out that although George has assumed responsibility for Lenny, he is growing tired of the trouble they get into together. He tells him, he could get along so easy and so nice if he didn't have to take care of Lenny. The most appealing side of his personality is his ability to weave a dreamlike spell over an audience by telling a story. Lenny begs him to 
tell how it's going to be. George then describes an idyllic farm fantasy home for the pair of them. He paints a very attractive picture of a house where the two men could build up a fire in the stove and sit set around it and listen to the rain coming down on the roof. This is their dream, a place of their own where they will not be bothered by anyone but instead enjoy simple comfort and security. George is also realistic and in anticipation of further trouble, he tells Lenny to meet him at this spot if anything bad happens. This shows the ability to plan a strategy in order to avoid danger in the future. Okay, so that was a sample answer for question A. And if we go back to plan, we see I've hit off most of the points I made there. Now, just to go back to question to the question. So describe this character at the beginning of the novel. Do we think we might have hit who this character is from the beginning of the novel with this? So we said what novel we study. We said we met, we met George, the protagonist. This is how he's described with his features. He's more alert than another character. And we also compare the other character to George. He's in authority. He's like, he's in the lead. He's in control. Um, and we know he's taking responsibility, but he's getting tired of taking this responsibility and the trouble that they're getting into and kind of always protecting the other character. Um, and then we talk more about as a personality and what he can do as a person and how he's a great storyteller. Um, and then also how he's realistic and he anticipates more trouble coming because he knows that maybe Lenny is going to just continue to be the same person regardless how much he scolds him okay so I think we might have described George as a character there so now we have to think about how has this character changed by the end of the novel like what's happened is he, is he the same is he the same man that we've we met at the start okay so of my cement point B. So this is another way I can plan as well. I plan as well. It depends, it's up to you. I know there's so many ways out there that people will be are able to plan. Sometimes I just scribble down a list or I like scribble all over the place. So this for question B, which is how has he changed? So George is still wiser, so no change there. Still uses a storytelling, no change there. This change that happened in the plot. So Lenny killing Curly's wife. I don't know why I put Mr. there. Um change. So lo no longer has hope. No point in running away. Must kill Lenny. Very direct I was with that with that plan there. Um, uh, give up on the dream world and fed up. Doesn't give out to Lenny. So this is where we see he's kind of so maybe he had a little bit. He was getting tired at the start, which we mentioned, but he has definitely he has no hope anymore. He's lost it. So that might be how he's changed as a character. So if we just read through this sample part B, okay. So at the end of the novel. George is still the wiser one of the two men. He is still well able to sell, to tell a story as he uses the fantasy of their little farm with the rabbits to distract Lenny while he shoots him. His plan to meet at, at this spot should any trouble arise proves to be helpful as Lenny has accidentally killed Curly's wife and has to flee for his life. The crucial difference in George is that he now realises that there's no hope for Lenny. In the beginning, he thought they could overcome the problems they had in the wet, in the weed, by running away to work in a different part of the country. Now he knows there is no point in running. This time, Lenny has broken the law in a fatal way by killing Curly's wife. He has endangered his own life. He will be killed either by Curly and Carlson or later by execution for the crime of murder. George appreciates how serious this is, but Lenny cannot fully understand his predicament. For this reason, George reluctantly decides to kill his good friend. George has changed in another key way. He now has to forsake his dream world, the farm where he and Lenny could live in harmony, feeding Lenny's rabbits and living off the land. Will never come to pass. George's dream is not going to happen and instead of a future of peace he must face an awful prospect of Lenny being cruelly killed for the crime of murder. Previously when bad things happened George would give out to Lenny. At the end of the story when they meet in the woods beside the Selena's river 
Lanny asked him, ain't you going to give me hell? This is the, this time, there's no need for George to scold Lenny. George has changed his attitude towards his friend. It was pointless to try teach him how to behave in the future. Okay, so I think we've hit most of the points in this, in the brainstorm I had for the, in the um, planning I had done there, um, which is just a list, really. Um, so George still being wise, we hit on that, his use of storytelling, the plot that changed, like what changed, like why did he change up on Lenny? He was already getting tired of Lenny, but what was the what was the last nail in the in the coffin? And the change, what's happened? If he he's given up on his dream world, he's fed up, doesn't even give out to Lenny at the end, he just tries to distract him before he kills him. So from this we had a look that we've seen that we've so first he would describe one of the characters. And then we've gone back and seen how they've changed and we've supported it with references to text. There was quotes thrown in. So we're going to have a quick little comment on, so part A, so we kind of stayed focused to who George was and how he was the protagonist and how he was the hero. And he's the main character. And there was evidence to back up. So we always need to have our evidence that is backed up. It was clear and effective. We kind of hit every point that we needed to. And in part B, the same thing. It was there was a there was a comp- clear change that we've mentioned. We definitely mentioned that the character has changed, and we're referring back to points we made in the previous bit, part A, and there was a use of quotes. Okay, so now we've got this new question here, which is choose a novel you have studied. To what extent has your understanding of people and human behavior been shaped by reading this novel? Explain your answer with reference to your chosen text. Okay, so straight off the bat, this is a much broader question. This isn't just on a character. It isn't just on a specific team. It isn't on a specific part of the novel. It's on just the overall novel itself. We're going to need to use this setting, the themes. Might will need to definitely need to include the characters, and then because look, let's talk about human behavior. Where's my pen? Human behavior. So a novel again that we studied, and how this novel has like changed how we understand people and behavior, the human behavior. After we read this novel, so how have we understood how humans react in situations or how humans behave in situations from this novel? So for this novel, for example, we're going to be using, instead of, of Mice and Men, now we're going to move on and use Once by Morris Gleitzman. And this novel, if we're not familiar with it, is set in World War II and it follows the story of a young boy. Okay? So just remember when we're, re- when we're planning for this question, what we need to focus on is really this bit here. Okay. And our our key focus is people. So we'll be using the characters for that. So people, people, my P looks funny there, people. And then the human behavior. That'd be too long for me to type out. Human behavior. So how people and human behavior is shaped from reading. How do we understand it? How is our understanding formed? Like how do we understand how humans deal in situations? So one second, just let me move on to the next page. So now we're gonna look at clear all drawings. We're going to look at planning our answer. Now I have just a broad kind of throwing of points I want to make or of just like points of this novel that I've just quickly done within like probably five minutes that relate back to the question. So once this is a novel, Felix is a main character. He's like nine or ten years old. He escapes orphanage. His parents put him into an orphanage to protect him. It's set in World War II Nazi Poland. These are other side characters that we could mention, Zelda and Barney. Um, so Zelda is a her actual parent, her father was actually a Nazi. Um, and Barney is a Jewish man who's protecting Jewish children. So just to start it off, so because we have to talk about oh, let me go backwards, sorry. Because we have to talk about understanding and what we have understanding of. Just to start off, I said I did not have a thorough grasp of the war and trauma and desperate situations. So we just didn't have that understanding of how people react in these situations when when your whole life is 
thrown apart because of a war or because of because you're being persecuted or anything terrible like that is happening to you so it's mentioning kind of like the themes of kind of like sacrifice family's been torn apart um felix here his innocence is being stri- is being stripped away it has an overall theme of kind of good versus evil that we're gonna have to mention like the good in humanity and the evil in humans and how humans just are at the root so because there's always good and there is always evil and that comes out in real life world and also in the world of fiction so we're going to read through an example answer here um so i studied a novel once by morris gleitzman once is a novel set in the time of world war ii it is narrated by felix the protagonist of the story felix is a nine-year-old jewish boy who escapes an orphanage in poland on a quest to find his parents Before I read the novel, I did not have a thorough grasp of the effects that trauma and desperate situations have on humans and how the good balances out the evil in the world. So that was our kind of introduction there. One of the most important things I learned while studying once is what humans do in desperate situations. This book is filled with shocking examples of desperate situations as families are torn apart and innocent people are killed by the utmost evil. When Felix's parents leave him in a Catholic orphanage to protect him from his faith, as a Jewish person living in Nazi-occupied Poland, his parents knew that they would never see their son again. They left him with a new Catholic identity, hoping this would save his life. This tremendous sacrifice shaped my knowledge on human behaviour knowing now that parents will do anything to protect their kids and their kids will always be a priority. I learned the heartbreaking truth of how innocence is stripped away. Oh, move my head, sorry. Is stripped away in trauma and how it was for Felix when the brutality of the Nazis took away his childlike innocence and imagination. This is apparent throughout the novel as Felix starts to see the harsh reality of the world, of the real world, and Felix's thinking process adapts as a result of this. Felix's innocence is ripped away slowly throughout the novel as he always assumes the good in people. When he was almost shot by a Nazi soldier, he assumed the soldier pulled the trigger by accident and would be feeling bad for killing an innocent farm boy. I recognise throughout the novel that the dif- the difference between good and bad. For example, the generosity of Barney, a Jewish man who protects children from Nazis, chose death over abandoning the people, abandoning the Jewish orphans he took care of. In contrast to this pure goodness, there was the pure evil of the Nazis. The Nazis killed and tortured innocent people and tore families apart. The good and evil in this case balance each other out as some people suffer the evil of Nazis but others are saved. Another example of good and evil balancing each other out in this book is when Felix saved a little girl Zelda from a deliberate fire set in her house by the Polish resistance. The evil in this is the Polish resistance shooting and killing Zelda's parents and attempting to kill Zelda. The good is represented in Felix saving Zelda, showing that good can come out of a bad situation. An underlying good versus evil in this is the fact that Zelda's parents were evil Nazis. But since she was saved by a Jew, she could be raised with different different ideals and grow up to be a good person. My understanding of human behaviour was greatly changed by this example. I learned the primary reason why humans commit evil crimes, the influence of their environment growing up. If Zelda had stayed in the Nazi family, she would have been brainwashed at a very young age to have a hatred of innocent Jews. However, since she was taken away from this toxic environment, her ideals were changed and she grew to hate Nazis. This hatred of Nazis is shown when she bit a Nazi soldier to join Felix and Barney on a train of Jewish people instead of safely staying with the Nazis. I also learned that one's positivity and imagination dictate their decisions and can be 
the difference between life and death. This is shown in the novel with Felix's innocence and optimistic imagination as he made different decisions throughout the novel based on his maturity and caution. For example, when Felix was innocent and was not aware of the dangers of Nazi Poland, he naively waved at Nazis and escaped the orphanage to find his mum and dad. Later in the novel, when he becomes more mature and cautious, he runs away when a Nazi finds him in the ghetto, knowing that he would be killed if he did not. This taught me that innocence can create ignorance, which can lead to dangerous situations and the outcome of one's survival is essentially based on luck. But I noticed it can also be a good thing. For example, Felix would not have kept his motivation to go to the city if he had not had if he had not had the blissful idea his parents were there in conclusion this novel has shaped my understanding of the good and bad in the world the pros and cons of childhood innocence human behavior in different situations and how this is affected by one's childhood environment I also was educated on the lives of Jews led in World War II, the lives Jews led in World War II. Okay, so this was a much longer kind of question because it wasn't broken up into two pieces. So it's, it definitely was a little bit more in depth, possibly. So just going back to the question there, just so we can kind of just assess what, what the good points of this response to this question were. So, so we had to tell how our understanding of people and human behavior was shaped by a novel so that was the main point we had to kind of get across in this answer so if we're going to look have a look through paragraphs here so this is our introduction this kind of just introducing the novel to us so one of the most important things i learned while studying is that humans do what humans do in desperate situations so it's we mentioned here that's filled the book is filled with shocking examples of desperate situations because these people have been put in an unbelievable circumstance where their families are being torn apart and people are being brutally killed by evil forces and children are sacri- people are sacrificing their religion as well because they're being sent to catholic orphanages to hide the fact that they're jewish to protect their their fate not like their actual fate but to protect their like survival but also they're not really protecting their faith in that case because they're switching their their religious beliefs um, his parents did this out of desperation to try and ensure that because his parents knew ultimately that their son would die if they didn't do this. And unfortunately, Felix decided that because he was so innocent that he decided he had to then save his parents. And then we go in and talk with, so in that paragraph there, we're really kind of showing how we see how people react in situations and how the human behavior is and how it adapts and then how trauma which is a human human behavior and kind of strips away our innocence and we're exposed when there's traumatic experiences happening in our life um we also mention in here the, the good versus evil theme or good versus bad team um how in even the worst situations there are people like barney who are helping other people and protecting people when we have forces like the nazis who are destroying lives and then if we have this example from Zelda here, which is very interesting because in the book we have Zelda, who's actually the pa- her parents were Nazis and the Polish resistance who would ultimately be seen as, as, um, as a good force because they're fighting against the Nazi forces who are like the utmost evil. So the Polish resistance in an attempt to fight back against the Nazi powers were killing innocent children as well. Well, we're attempting to kill innocent children as well because these children were children of Nazis, but Zelda survived. But then we have here, because Zelda was taken out of that situation where she wasn't yet brainwashed by the ideals of her parents and the ideas that they had. Um, She grew up to then be fond of Jewish people and to even go against the Nazis who would be typically on her side. Um, when she bit a Nazi soldier to join Felix and Barney on a train which was headed to a concentration camp. We also have here then the kind of this is more bringing back into the human behaviour so positivity and imagination and how that dictates 
people's decisions between life and death. Um, we talk about people's innocence and optimistic imagination and how we, we can, when we mature, we can kind of proceed with more caution as opposed to when we're innocent, we might be a bit more ignorant to what's going around to us. Um, an example of that backed up and then the conclusion here. So the conclusion, just that this novel shaped my understanding. I think maybe for this answer, we could probably bring in a bit more of, of it shaped our understanding mentioned and maybe more quotes for this one I think I mean it's it's a great response and it definitely does answer the question which is that's the that's the main point we need to answer the question make sure we are answering the question it doesn't go too off top it doesn't go off topic but maybe if we we're just to back it up with a bit more quotes instead of just saying what what was said like for an example with the one with the parents if anyone's read the book they know that I think the parents said to Felix that like oh, we will always love you or remember us. Actually, it was remember us, I'm pretty sure. Um, or we could maybe mention that quote in there where his parents had even said to remember them was they knew their own faith and they did that out of sacrifice. To, they sacrificed themselves to protect their child. So now that we've looked through two examples of questions that could come up on fiction, we've gone through kind of what we need to know in fiction and what comes up on the exam and we have some words that we learn which in when we look at the um the sample answers they use like the word they didn't use antagonist to be but we use the protagonist um we mentioned all that like what happened like maybe we've mentioned we could mention like themes a bit more explicitly in our answers like all these this vocabulary is needed in our sample in our exam in our answers so I hope that has made the fiction section a little bit more clear for us and we understand how to, what comes up, what we need to know. Um, and even if we could just look at them sample answers and maybe take what we can from them, because at the end of the day, they're just sample answers and you can kind of fit a lot of these. This one is, is a lot more maybe clear and precise and a lot more straightforward and has, has great use of quotes. This one will be a much longer question because it's two of those questions combined together, which is why I felt like a little bit longer to read through. Um, and just take on board how and look at other sample answers on maybe the novels that you've studied so you can kind of see how other people are answering them and what, what's, what we're aiming for when we're, when we're answering a, a question like that. Okay, so thank you very much and good luck with your Junior Cycle English.